Yeah, we'll just wait a bit. There's a bit of a lag, like a one minute lag between Zoom and YouTube. Okay, green light to start. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this webinar at uh, Brookings India, or at least in the virtual world. Uh, my name is Constantino Xavier. I'm a fellow in the Foreign Policy and Security Studies program at Brookings India here in Delhi. Uh, thanks all for joining us for the next hour and a half. Uh, we will be taking an in-depth um, look at the effects of this global COVID crisis on the agenda of regional connectivity in South Asia between India and its various neighbors. Uh, this is an event that's part of a larger initiative we are hosting at Brookings India called the Samband Initiative. Under Samband, we focus on many aspects of regional connectivity, not so much the original and classic dimensions of trade and economics, but also many other soft connectivity angles of people to people, uh, of uh, tourism, education, which we've been uh, tracking and researching as a part of our research program. So as you all know, and I'm sure you're all experiencing it, in fact, this is exactly why we are here today in a virtual world rather than a physical mode. The COVID crisis has really ravaged the globe uh, and it's really unleashed, I think, every type of behavior that goes against the spirit of connectivity. It's really taken us in the opposite directions. Uh, borders have been closed down. Uh, lockdown policies have been uh, taking effect across the world. We've had a variety of economic protectionist policies and a broader economic introversion. Uh, we just heard the Prime Minister of India yesterday speak repeatedly about self-reliance um, in the economy. Finally, even in terms of international institutions and global governance, we've seen many weaknesses come up, a lot of conflicts, mostly highlighted in the World Health Organization uh, disputes between the US, China, and other countries. So against this uh, mode of sort of or momentum of connectivity, many regions are struggling to cooperate, to address this collective action problem, which is a virus, a public health issue, a pandemic together and cooperatively. We've seen problems arise in the European Union, which traditionally has been a very strong regional and integrated bloc. Uh, ASEAN in Southeast Asia has struggled to come up with common responses. But particularly here in South Asia, um, in uh, uh, this region, uh, where we saw a tremendous movement towards connectivity, interdependence, integration in recent years, uh, from India, from Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, this has really become a new buzzword and has really driven many policies in the region. This is particularly of concern uh, because this remains a deeply disconnected region, low levels of trade, abysmal cross-border infrastructure, very weak regional institutions. So in many ways, this has interrupted, I think, that momentum towards connectivity. So while we're talking about a public health and immediate policy challenge, um, there's also a broader issue of you know, a region that has 2 billion people, China next door, Southeast Asia next door, the Gulf region next door, uh, really the center, uh, demographic center in many ways of the world. Uh, but we also have, beyond this public health issue affecting 2 billion people uh, or more, a long-term economic connectivity and strategic challenge. There have been also positive developments, of course. India has delivered some economic aid to many of its neighbors. Bangladesh has supported the Maldives, for example. China has come to the rescue of Nepal with a lot of uh, equipment and support to um, combat this pandemic. But I think I think you'll all agree that tremendous questions remain whether connectivity will come to a halt or actually be reversed in the region. And will this really reinforce, you know, the sense of isolation uh, and policies? Or on the other hand, maybe this is an opportunity for more openness. We saw recently India coming up uh, with a possibility of reconsidering joining the RCEP trade arrangement. Second question, I think, very uh, critical these days is what role for institutions, uh, multilateralism, uh, whether it's SARC in South Asia, BIMSTEC in the Bay of Bengal region, but also multilateral uh, organizations, whether it's the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, or the Asia Infra Infrastructure Investment Bank. Finally, also what geopolitical realignments are happening in this region? Um, US-China relations are turning more hostile in recent weeks. 
There are questions whether this will strengthen or weaken the Belt and Road Initiative investments from China in the South Asian region towards connectivity. Also, what role for other countries, in particular India, of course, as the predominant power in, the, in this region, but also Japan, ASEAN, Australia, and other sort of Indo-Pacific middle powers. So to address these three broad questions, it's really wonderful to have three speakers from the region. And I thought it was interesting for a change rather than discussing the region from Delhi with Indian perspectives, instead to get three different perspectives from India's neighboring countries that are in many ways at the forefront of this crisis and of these dilemmas of connectivity. Uh, we have three wonderful speakers from Bangladesh, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. I'll start ladies first. Uh, from Colombo, we're joined by Dr. Dinusha Pandita Ratne. She's a non-resident fellow at the Lakshman Kadigramar Institute, Sri Lanka. Previously, she served as the executive director at the same institute, LKI. And prior to her appointment at uh, Lakshman Kadigramar Institute, she was also an adjunct professor at the Faculty of Law at the Chinese University of Hong Kong also a visiting fellow at the University of Hong Kong. She's an attorney admitted to practice in the state of New York, in fact, has a degree, I think, from Yale University, if I'm not mistaken, and her interests in terms of research include, of course, Sri Lankan foreign policy, China's foreign relations in Asia, the Indian Ocean region, international law, and human rights. From Dhaka, we're joined by Syed Munir Kasru. Uh, he's a chairman of the Institute for Policy Advocacy and Governance, IPAG, which is an international think tank based out of Dhaka, but with also offices in Melbourne, Delhi, Vienna, and Dubai. He's a global expert and speaker at the World Economic Forum, Geneva, Switzerland, and member of the SDGs Global Council. Munirda writes extensively on the SDG objectives, economic issues, international relations, and strategic affairs, and also most importantly here for today, regional integration and connectivity. Finally, from Kathmandu, we're joined by Dr. George Verghese, who's a senior strategic advisor at the Niti Foundation in Nepal. From 2000 to 2018, he worked with the Asia Foundation in various capacities as country director of Nepal and as a country director also for Afghanistan. He also worked as an advisor for the United Nations Development Program in Nepal. He served as an excellence chair and visiting professor at the University of Wyoming's Global and Area Studies Program, and is a senior visiting fellow of the Australian National University's Asia Pacific College of Diplomacy. His research interests include public policy, political theory, and environmental policy. So before we get into this discussion, just a quick note for all of you joining us through Zoom and YouTube, where we're also live streaming this. Um, if you have questions, we've collected several good questions already. Do send them in in the chat box and Zoom on YouTube, uh, and we'll be collecting them and take hopefully as many as possible. So let me start, I think, uh, with the Southern perspective. Dinusha, if I may come first to you uh, in Sri Lanka. You know, we are talking before that so far the response has been quite good in terms of the public health uh, challenge in Sri Lanka. But I'd like you to talk a bit about the you know, the, the political uh, context in Sri Lanka and the policies of the country. Um, you have elections coming up, messy elections, if I may say up. The dates have been changed and there's a big discussion around that. You have a strong government uh, led by brothers, a prime minister and a president that is deeply entrenched in the country. But at the same time, Sri Lanka, as you know, has been really the forefront of the agendas of connectivity, economic openness, free trade in the region. So you know, do you see now, would you see also like a tendency towards more self-reliance and protectionism in Sri Lanka, or can we still count on Sri Lanka to take sort of a more proactive policy agenda uh, for the region? Uh, thank you very much, Tino, for uh, having me. And it's great to be in this conversation with you and George and Munir. Um, great question to start off on uh, in terms of whether it's sort of closing in on itself due to uh, the pandemic. Um, if I can just briefly preface those remarks by um, just explaining where Sri Lanka is in trying to contain the pandemic. Um, you alluded to a strong government. Uh, indeed, uh, the approach can be characterized as uh, a decisive approach to containing the, the outbreak. So um, very, very strong um, border controls were imposed, curfew was imposed uh, nationwide, uh, some continuous, some parts continuously, some parts not continuously, 
uh, but overall for about seven weeks. And it's just been relaxed a little bit this week. Uh, so numbers are relatively low, uh, less than 1,000 cases, um, and nine deaths. Um, so those numbers have uh, been attributed to this strong government and the strong state that you have um, it, that you quite rightly uh, identified. A uh, couple of different surveys have come out from independent uh, sources on you know, how well people think the government has handled this, uh, this outbreak uh, uh, of COVID-19. And both surveys pointed to a, a very high degree of public satisfaction you know, plus 90% satisfaction with um, the health services, uh, the armed forces, which have been uh, very involved, again, consistent with that strong uh, sort of statist approach that you mentioned, um, and uh, very high ratings for the president himself. Interestingly, less high ratings for the prime minister, who has, who has been sort of um, uh, taking a, a more of a backseat role. So in a sense, the, what I think the majority voted for, the majority of voters voted for in November 19 was in fact that strong government, the status of strong government. Uh, the push for that came off, of course, of a very difficult few years culminating in uh, the Easter attacks. So when I mean difficult, sort of um, in a sense of, of presenting a strong government. Um, so the, the will for a strong government was there. And I think the government has tried to show the benefits of that in this, uh, in this period. In terms of protectionism, whether it's closing in on itself, here I think the outcomes are being driven by the economic realities, right? So you know, generally a favorable health outcome so far, uh, caveats there of course are testing and testing levels and uh, you know, what happens when we relax the curfew, but the health outcomes have been relatively good so far. What has been pretty devastating is the economic outcomes and that on the heels of uh, Sri Lanka's uh, very high debt levels, need to service that debt, low foreign currency reserves. So in reaction to that economic hit, it has imposed very strong import controls until July, almost you know, you know, very comprehensive import controls, um, except for essential goods and for goods that are inputs into Sri Lanka's exports. So I think those, you know, that has been driven by um, pragmatic economic considerations rather than sort of an ideological backlash against that co connectivity history that you described of, of Sri Lanka. Um, at the same time, there is an underlying, I would say, an sort of underlying paradox that Sri Lanka has yet to resolve in the long term of this incredible location at the center of global trading routes. Uh, we always talk about Sri Lanka's strategic location, but there is also um, somewhat of an ambivalence towards the outside world for historical reasons. So yeah, that, that's a little bit part of it, uh, that's, and that's in the background. But I, I, I think at the moment, the central driver is the economic realities. And also, I think you mentioned that the debt ceiling, right, is being, uh, 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 being reached, right, within this month or next month. Yeah, I, I, I didn't mention that, but yes, the, that, that is correct, that it, it, has, um, it has gone beyond the, uh, the debt ceiling that was approved um, on the vote of account. Uh, so, so that issue is there, uh, but the more long-standing issue is Sri Lanka's overall debt to GDP ratio, which is you know, nearing um, you know, is the late 80%, so nearing 90%, uh, and it's, it's low levels of foreign, um, foreign reserves. So, so that's the perhaps... The, the stronger driver. Good, thanks, Dinusha. Um, if we move northwards uh, to Dhaka, Munir, I think you know very similar uh, uh, um, issues. I think in, in Bangladesh, right? You have a very strong government, again, very stable, firmly in the saddle. Growth, unlike in Sri Lanka, was actually skyrocketing. Skyrocketing in Bangladesh, it was seen as a poster boy of growth in South Asia, doing better than India in many ways. Uh, you know, now with this COVID crisis, what do you expect? I mean, will this really lead also to some type of introversion? Uh, will this lead to some protectionist tendencies? Will this deflate the whole connectivity agenda that DACA has been driving, in particular with ASEAN as a bridge between South and Southeast Asia? Well, thank you, Tino, and uh, uh, thanks for inviting me and having me in. And of course, it's a pleasure to join Dinush and George as well. 
Uh, I guess Bangladesh is uh, in by and large not facing situation very different than many of our neighbors are doing in South Asia. But in our case, uh, probably uh, it's component by the fact that uh, we have not export diversified as much as we should have. So a critical component comes from RMG. We have done well. Uh, we have been frequently quoted as one of the success model in textile and RMG. But now, now the problem is with this lockdown and everything, you, you can fairly imagine the economy is in a very serious situation. They, even after this lockdown started, we have had a number of rounds of postponements of orders running into billions of dollars and about 1 million RMG workers displaced significant portion in women. And it went to the level that our prime minister herself started making calls to many of the European heads of state, asking them to hold on to the orders. So we are in a little tricky situation. So in a way, I think it's good because we needed to realize sooner than later, we need to diversify our export portfolio. It's not a healthy thing to be dependent on one particular sector year after year, even if you're doing well. The second comes to overall micro macroeconomic uh, situation. Yes, uh, you are right in pointing out we have had certain degree of stability and growth and uh, economy by and large have covered around somewhere between six to 7%. And we have uh, as very, very frequently quoted as the stable factor in South Asia. But moving to the next level, how do we absorb the shock remains largely, uh, remains to be seen. And as you can fairly imagine coming to COVID-19, in a resource constrained country like us, where it's, and even if you talk about Dhaka, extremely densely populated. So it's very difficult to know uh, how many people actually symptomatic, asymptomatic have been affected. And I'm sure the government is struggling when to open up because uh, as you may have heard in Pakistan, Imran Khan has been saying time and again that we can't afford to keep the lockdown long because a lot of people are going I mean, they will die out of starvation. Similar situation here. We can't keep it locked down forever. But again, the question is when we open up, you know, Eid is coming up. We're going through the month of fasting. So at some point, government will have to open up sooner or later. But the question is what happens then? There's a big, huge question mark we have to deal with. Under the best of circumstances, if you're lucky, whatever we have had so far, 150,000 tests around, say, 20,000 identification, uh, about three, 400 people have passed away, like, according to official statistics. If that remains certain, I think we would have weathered the stock. But as you could see, even in developed countries like UK, US, Germany, even even if they've come out, they have had to go back to the second rounds of spike. So for us, it's a huge question mark. And definitely in an economy which has done well, but also not diversified as much as we should have, we're in a very tricky zone. So for us, the regional things become a little easier that it's more easier lines to connect. You have so many, you have a 2 billion market next door. So you can cut down transport costs. You can uh, boost the connectivity, which I'm sure in the next round, we three of us will join in. So for Bangladesh, particularly in this precarious situation, that can be one way out if we can take advantage of the region. And you know, with, you know, with India, we have a lot of openings in recent years. So if we can start taking advantage of Northeast connectivity and also the regional exchange, we have a better chance of weathering this uh, pandemic and common challenge that uh, each of us is facing. Yes. Good. And, uh, and in terms of regional supply chains, I mean, on textiles in particular, I think this will hit, obviously, but has hit Bangladesh very hard already. Plus the lack of remittances, right, from the returning Bangladeshis worldwide. True. Uh, I mean, we have been no less hit, uh, hard hit than Nepal. For example, if you look at Nepal, I mean, they also increasingly depend on 25% of info comes from Forex, which has come down to one. In our case, a significant portion, particularly, you know, the low labor, low skill laborers in a very difficult situation, they're out of their job and they're stranded in countries like, you know, Saudi Arab, UAE, are not having the option to come back, just surviving on the bare minimum. And there are jobs, so definitely it will have an in, impact on the, I mean, forex uh, remittance inflow. So that is something on the post or immediate. In, I won't say post COVID because I guess we are getting more used to COVID normal life. So how do we handle that labor portion? And it will need the best level of economic diplomacy the government can deploy to make sure those people who are there actually can go back to job and don't come back home. You know. Uh, penniless and go back to the villages and the sort of dilapidated condition they may end up with. Yes. Great. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Munir. Uh, George, let's turn to you. Uh, domestically, Nepal, uh, again, a strong government. It sounds like this is a very different South Asia from 10 years ago. We had so many fragile coalition governments. 
but a, a deeply entrenched government with a strong stability in government, but going through a lot of crises now uh, in the last uh, few weeks, uh, possible splits, tensions internally. And you know, I think you've mentioned this many times in your writings, uh, the challenge between politics, hyper politics in many ways, and very weak governance mechanisms, very sort of you know, understaffed, under expert, or lacking in terms of expertise and just lack in terms of autonomy and empowerment, uh, that Nepali, Nepali bureaucracy in the government. If you could speak about that tension a bit in the response Nepal has been adopted, has been adopting towards uh, this pandemic. Uh, thanks, you know, um, I'm glad to be here with you. Um, as I mentioned in our background chat, I think it's really important to situate Nepal's current circumstances in the broader context of Nepal's transition, uh, governance transition, which began uh, formally in 2015 with the new constitution. And that transition is moving uh, Nepal from being a unitary centralized uh, uh, state to a federalized state with uh, seven provinces, which are brand new units of government and 750 municipalities. So essentially we have, including the federal government, we have 761 centers of power under this new uh, uh, governance uh, structure. And so uh, beginning with the earthquakes followed by the floods in 2018 and now the coronavirus, I mean, Nepal is in a very precarious position. And so a governance transition to manage while we are also dealing with these kinds of uh, disasters, so to speak. So that's the context within which we find ourselves now. The first reaction of government has been to adopt a very muscular lockdown. We shut down even before India did. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've, uh, on, in terms of the numbers, uh, relatively few compared to many other countries. But as most, most of us know, that could be because also of our testing capabilities. We've tested about 16,000 of our population using PCR, of which as of today, we have about 219 confirmed cases uh, with a few recoveries on the way. Of course, you know that we share an 18,000 kilometer open border with India. And it has several border posts, but generally the border is considered porous. So the relations uh, between India and Nepal really do color and shape our COVID response in the sense that we have at any given time, several million Indians working in Nepal who wish to go back when this occurred. Similarly, we have several million Nepali migrants, seasonal and others who wish to come back when this happened. So they're all stuck at these border towns and in these border locations. Many Nepalis are also in the no man's land of the border between India and Nepal with very few facilities. And so what you're seeing now is recent up the spike in cases uh, has to do with what I call a leakage in the, in the shutdown, that people are trying to find ways to cross and get back home. And so they are being found and they're being tested. Um, but on the whole, to speak to your comment about how's politics shaping this, I think that because of federalism, I think the response is a bit more compassionate, a bit more accountable. Uh, we have provincial governments and local governments doing the best they can in terms of being responsive to the need. Uh, Kathmandu, unfortunately, is very much stuck in a very narrow self-interested politics where a battle for survival is being fought by Prime Minister Oli within his own party in terms of confidence to lead. And he's largely uh, finding it quite difficult. Partly he's recovering, as you know, from a significant surgery of a kidney replacement. And so that's weakened him obviously physically. But other than that, within his party itself, uh, having come to power on the basis of a nationalistic agenda and slogan following the blockade with India, uh, you know, he's, he's failed to uh, really use the majority that he enjoys to uh, begin some fundamental governance reforms that are essential. Uh, George, if I may follow up then on this a bit of a regional angle now, you know, him, there's no other country in many ways that has more to gain from connectivity than Nepal, right? I mean, you between literally the two largest Asian consumer markets, China and India, you've heard now for 10 years, a variety of initiatives about an Himalayan corridor of connectivity, China pushing India a bit more reluctant, Nepal trying to make the case that it's a platform to connect China and India. You know, do you see any real strategy, you know, driving the government to make uh, this into reality? I mean, one thing is obviously beautiful words, but is that happening? Is there thinking? And in many ways, will this be a victim of this largest sort of a crisis now? 
I don't think connectivity will be a victim for several reasons. One is that uh, the level of connectivity we enjoy with India uh, is far greater than the statist uh, sponsored connectivity. So it's at the level of people, it's at the level of communities. There are uh, marriage links, the community links, ethnic links. And then the traders who go back and forth across the border, both Indian and Nepali. So that is, uh, that will continue uh, happening. But more importantly, Nepal's, uh, uh, Nepal's economy has depended on connectivity increasingly over the last several years. I mean, if you think about remittances, of course, as Munir also mentioned, we're really dependent on sending our people out to earn money to send back. So we need to continue that. That suffered hugely during this crisis, already dropped by 40%. Uh, but we also depend on tourism. And as you know, Nepal uh, 2020 was supposed to be the Visit Nepal year, uh, formally announced by the government to encourage uh, uh, growth in tourism. Uh, in, in addition to tourism and remittances, our other fallback to the economy uh, was agriculture. But over the last 10, 15 years, we've gone from being a relatively sort of uh, uh, being able to uh, generate some of our own inputs into the food supply chain to being almost fully reliant on especially India for our uh, inputs for agriculture and even for food. And so for those reasons, I don't see us recovering and uh, denying connectivity. I think we need increased connectivity at least to begin to shape some policy responses for the long term, because we're gonna to continue to need those inputs, continue to need those remittances, and continue to need them. Um, and I think, uh, uh, Certainly there is the call, just like everybody else, to look at self-reliance in food. I've also called for self-reliance in energy, especially renewable energy, because we depend a lot on India for petroleum products, as you know. And every time we have a crisis, these two things always render us existentially vulnerable, food and energy. So I think we are confronting it now. Uh, but recently the, the, the government has opened up the the agricultural sector for uh, harvest and for planting, the monsoonal rice uh, paddy plantation. So we hope that this season's uh, agriculture is saved to the extent that we do have a little bit of agriculture, but I think we really do need to do some activity to, uh, uh, to uh, begin uh, a strategic policy of uh, crisis resilience for the future. But still, let me just push you, George, if I may, please, on the, on the regional angle. You have today you know, People's Liberation Army airplane at the airport in Kathmandu delivering precious and important aid to Nepal. Uh, you have a crisis between India and Nepal playing out on the border. So one question, for example, just came in from Akhile Shupadia, who's with you in Kathmandu, a journalist uh, uh, over there. I mean, he really says, uh, you know, to many Nepalis, while the idea of South Asia cooperation and New Delhi's assistance seemed quite, fight, quite far-fetched these days. And Beijing seems to be delivering in terms of sales, in terms of support, in terms of equipment. Do you have any comments on that angle? Thanks. Sorry, can you repeat, repeat the last bit? I had to pull off my ears because folks yeah. are not. No, I'm the, the tension that you paradoxically have now, tension between India and Nepal. I mean, that there's no hiding these days, the dispute on the border playing out, a completely anti connectivity agenda driving the relations, right? Borders, fencing. Uh, all the security logic. And then uh, you have China actually delivering uh, a lot of important aid and support. So how's that seen in terms of shaping the connectivity agenda? In well, for one, I don't think it's only China who's delivering supplies. I mean, India has also delivered significant supplies, but so have some other countries. Uh, and Nepal enjoys uh, uh, a huge amount of goodwill uh, internationally and has received uh, enormous amounts of foreign aid, especially with regard to the coronavirus countries like Switzerland and others continue to give to Nepal. So uh, in terms of receiving, of course, China may in terms of quantity be one of the suppliers, but surely India has also ordered uh, supplies from China and so have other countries. So that, that notwithstanding the border with China, there is one border post that's formally uh, remained open. Uh, and the agreement with uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, and Prime Minister Oli is to keep the, uh, the formally uh, stationed border posts open for the movement of uh, supplies, not people, but supplies. So the border is sealed, but in terms of supplies going back and forth, that's happening. But in terms of connectivity, uh, let me just, since you've, uh, since you've uh, uh, provoked me, I wanted to bring us back to the point that we discussed a few weeks ago, Tino, about the benefits and costs of connectivity. 
And you rightly mentioned that connectivity is a collective action uh, problem. And in collective action, a cost benefit analysis must return us to the point of understanding who benefits most and who might cost be disproportionately assigned to. And small states around India would certainly bear costs uh, greater than uh, what India would, uh, proportionately speaking, in terms of benefits. Uh, so in terms of a cost benefit analysis, I think India has to be prepared to assist and talk about how connectivity uh, not only benefits India, but certainly benefits uh, countries like Nepal, uh, but that India would be willing to assist with some of these. That would be one. Second is my own pet peeve that people think of connectivity as if opening up doesn't imply more controls around security. More controls and, security. And, and when there are when there are relatively soft states such as Nepal and everyone around uh, you know this panel and probably listening would agree that Nepal is quite soft not only formally but also informally. And if that is the case, how do we ensure that when we open up through connectivity? that security issues are managed in a smart way. I mean, I'm not saying that shutting down the border in a physical muscular way is really going to help because people want to get across, get across in the most militarized zones of the world. So why wouldn't they do that in India and Nepal? But I would say that uh, Nepal is certainly very open to connectivity. I think the noise you hear around Lipu Lake, for example, uh, partly is political noise uh, that speaks to the nationalistic kind of agenda that brings politicians once again in the public view as people protecting sovereignty. Uh, conversations between India and Nepal, as I understand it, both the Nepali foreign minister as well as the uh, Indian government have said that both knew of the road being created. I assume there is an information gap. I assume there is a little bit of a lack of protocol in terms of how often one keeps updated on these things. But, uh, but to me, this is not a surprise. Uh, India and sometimes China are frequently used by uh, our politicians here to um, gain quick points, especially when their popularity is waning. So I would take this with a pinch of salt. Thanks, George. Uh, Munir, if we may move to, to you uh, and Dak, I think question coming from uh, Anvesha Ray Chaudhry. She's at the Aspen Center here in Delhi. She has a very simple, but I think a very a basic and important question, which is, what is the future of BIMSTEC and Bay of Bengal regionalism? You know, for three years, we've heard about BIMSTEC, BIMSTEC, BIMSTEC. Uh, one of the 14 working groups of this regional organization of seven states in the Bay of Bengal actually has health as a topic. Uh, why have we not heard of, uh, of BIMSTEC? I mean, you're probably sitting quite close to headquarters, I assume, in Dhaka. <laughs> I would. <clears throat> I wish that geographic proximity would have tasked something more significant in terms of answering your question. <laughs> Nonetheless, I think sometimes <clears throat> I say it in a lighter note, and but equally true that in this part of the world, South Asia and others, I sometimes say that uh, South Southeast Asia, we people have not still found out that critical departure point between you know talking and walking. I mean, at some point you have to walk the talk. So BIMSTEC is a very, unfortunately, I hope not, doesn't become another SARC, like you know, years of conversation, a lot of goodwill, and a lot of you know, conferences, seminars, many of which you come, I go, we join. So one of the reasons, I think it's a, a perceptually, that's the, since we're having a very candid discussion, perceptually, many of you in this part of the world that BIMSTEC is a alternative platform to SARC being mostly led by India, keeping Pakistan out. That's the perceptual issue we many South Asians have. Now, having said that, many countries are not comfortable being caught between this, you know, 75 years of uh, wrangling between India and Pakistan, one way or the other. So while uh, you see a member signing up, if you look at a grassroots level, a momentum, it's India mostly who's spearheading most of the initiatives, whether it's security or connectivity, so until at political leadership level, you have that kind of real commitment, things I am afraid may not uh, sort of pick up the kind of pace we expected because two decades have gone by. So we haven't had much to showcase that you very correctly have pointed out. And there is no dearth of uh, top-notch intellectual experts, civil society think tanks, ideas, projects, and so on and so forth. But as you know, no less than I do, you know, end of the day, is the political leadership at the helm of affairs we have to i'll give you a simple example if you remember the goa thing uh, that would happen in the beamstack 
one of the issue that drove wedge because India was very insistent to have a joint communique, which indirectly implied Pakistan, which many of the other member states were not comfortable signing it. So those small, small things actually sometimes, you know, negatively affect the kind of synergy. So I would tend to put it this way, that I have a lot of wonderful friends in, in the Indian, you know, diplomacy. I think India needs to probably find a more smarter strategy and bring and make it more inclusive as opposed to the perceptual issue we now have, that it's a second front and may not have the kind of resources a country like China brings in, where Xi Jinping goes with, you know, with billions of dollars of, you know, so that kind of resources we don't have. So one good starting point could have been the low hanging fruits, more knowledge sharing, information sharing, technical know-how, best practices that can be a good starting point that are having this huge projects needing uh, infusion of billions of dollars, which simply these countries do not have the way China can drive BR. I'm giving a very pragmatic answer. So, at the, so the answer is twofold. One is the political leadership coming together and mostly led by India at, at a more regional level. Secondly, to look into more realistic projects, which are uh, implementable in the short, medium term, then probably look into those mega billion dollar projects, which needs significant amount of funding and so on and so forth. To follow up on your question from uh, Bishal Chalice, um, he asked actually, what lessons do you think are there for countries that want to pursue connectivity without India or even Pakistan? Let me put it like that, following up on your, on your comment that sometimes this India-Pakistan tension hijacks institutions, turns regional cooperation difficult. It's almost a shadow, right? From what you're saying on, on many of these issues, right? You constantly have to be careful. What are you doing with India that may upset Pakistan? What are you doing with Pakistan that upsets India? Bangladesh, actually, I saw the Ministry of Foreign Affairs delivered uh, aid to the Maldives uh, supplies and, and relief. So is there also initiative possible, say, from Bangladesh together with Sri Lanka, with Nepal, that can pursue regionalism without waiting for India or other actors to take a, 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 the lead? Maybe that's a good third angle uh, we should start looking into, because the tragedy is uh, since uh, India split into first into two, then three, when we parted off from Pakistan, right, in 71. So uh, I sometimes, you know, jokingly tell my Indian and Pakistani friends that you two countries will probably celebrate 100 years of enmity. I mean, you're just 25 years away. So the problem is close to 2 billion people are held hostage to two countries. Imagine the sort of connectivity, imagine the sort of trade gains we could have had. I mean, even now it's open secret, India and Pakistan do trading through Dubai. Everybody knows about that, billions of dollars. So, so why do you have to go this Dubai routing when you're just next to each other? And why do you have to, it's just a device common sense. Now, I'm not taking any side between India and Pakistan, but going by sheer size, India is definitely in terms of size, population, economy, mention any criteria is the leader in this region. So India is the sort of magnet which attracts outside attention, whether it's Europe or North America or South America. So if you are the magnet, you also have to be magnanimous. And for example, this COVID-19 thing, I personally felt Prime Minister Modi did a great thing trying to bring regional leaders together. But what would it be even greater if he has the heart enough to call, pick up the phone and call Imran Khan and ask that, you know, we two are the biggest countries in this region. This is for the first time, all the eight countries are facing a common enemy, right? A common enemy, which is taking lives. I mean, which is a silent killer, opposed to warfare, when you have exchange of fires and missiles and people are dying, right? So uh, I think in one of my upcoming articles, you may see, I've written about the Indian uh, journals, that COVID-19 in a way could be the panacea for South Asia if political leadership finally could rise to the occasion. And we have two very charismatic leaders, Prime Minister Modi and Imran Khan, who in different ways have, you know, uh, had very good followings in terms of, and they are very strong leaders in their own rights. So this could be one of those, I hope, occasion. And if, when you talk about SARC, for example, why do you need this uh, umbrella? You already have a SARC food bank. You already have a SARC finance committee. You have a, already have a SARC agriculture center. Just activate them. So what, I mean, you already have those things in place which are dormant for decades. So if the general goodwill intent is there, just activate them. And we have got a brilliant scientist agriculture and that can be one of the few areas we can start coming together. So my, just to wrap up my answer, BIMSTEC is there, but I personally don't think it should be positioned the way it is now, something 
opposite to SARC and in a way try to sort of uh, make SARC disappear. That really doesn't go well in the region, in my opinion. Thanks, uh, Munir. I think that's a perfect uh, uh, a lead into the next question. I think, Dinesh, Dinusha, I have for you, which is, you know, former Prime Minister of Sri Lanka, Ranil Vikramasinghe, has been actually quite bullish on the regional cooperation agenda uh, after retiring. He's given several speeches. I remember him in February proposing an economic integration roadmap for South Asia. Uh, then in April, already during the pandemic uh, a crisis, uh, he spoke against the tide and actually I quote him, he said, this is a good time for regional cooperation programs. Uh, he suggests India, maybe Pakistan also should take a lead. SARC should also be involved. Uh, as you know, the current secretary general of SARC is actually a very re reputed uh, a high profile diplomat from Sri Lanka, uh, who's heading the institution now and the secretary in Kathmandu. At the same time, you know, and I, you have this whole SARC talk, right? And we talk about SARC, uh, SARC funds, SARC summits, but the regional organization hasn't really done much. Um, is that the sense you get also in Colombo or what, what, is, uh, what do you see uh, in terms of the prospective positions that uh, the Sri Lankan government may take towards the region? Uh, yes, I'm speaking obviously from a, a non-official perspective here, but I think there is a sense of um, uh, you know, people are slightly perplexed as to uh, why the central regional organizations can't play a more central role. Um, and uh, that's true of SARC as well as for BIMSTEC. You rightly pointed out that BIMSTEC has a dedicated sectoral focus on public health. Um, and if that can't be activated at a time like this in with a cl clear public health crisis, uh, one has to really question, um, you know, all the resources, not just in, 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 in monetary terms, but in, in terms of human resources and, and time and energy um, that is, is spent on those organizations. And that's particularly so when, as you also rightly pointed out, they have excellent, um, excellent heads or capacity at the secretariats themselves. And you mentioned very rightly, Mr. Wirakun, uh, as, uh, as a very capable secretary general, um, is SARC. A couple of different things um, to say about that. One is I think SARC could prioritize a couple of different areas at this point. Um, uh, the first is something that was mentioned by my colleague uh, Ganesh and Wignaraja was that, that SARC really could prioritize the, the medical treatment of COVID to ensure that any eventual vaccine or any eventual medical treatment is accessible uh, throughout uh, South Asia, as opposed to in the production centers, which may be well away from South Asia. So that's something that uh, they could focus on. Um, uh, and the second uh, aspect for SARC is a more long-term project of really trying to build the cultural identity. I mean, we, we take it for granted with that we have longstanding culturally, uh, cultural and uh, linguistic and people-to-people -people links. But when you kind of, you know, cut through those and especially seeing the people to people links that are being built by uh, by China, that there, there is really a need, I think, to build a more cohesive regional identity uh, that, that SAR could uh, feed, perhaps in digital ways as well. We had at LKI uh, a seminar last year on uh, cultural heritage and how that could perhaps be protected through virtual museums, digital museums. I mean, that's that's a big thing at the moment. Um, all around the world. It doesn't take much money to do that. Uh, you could focus perhaps even on post-independence modern art. So you, you, you present that as a forward-looking um, uh, forward project. Um, so a couple of things for SARC there. Um, in terms of um, the, the one organization we haven't mentioned so far, which is regional, of course, doesn't encompass everybody uh, in SARC, but it's IORA. Uh, so uh, IORA has, um, from I think a Sri Lankan perspective, uh, a strong potential as a complementary organization to SARC and BIMSTEC, uh, partly because Sri Lanka's geography is a little bit different to some of the other uh, South Asian countries, more uh, maritime or water-centered. Um, and uh, it, it, you know, the, there are a couple of things that are also pushing would push IORA to be a little bit more effective. One is it has um, in Australia, Singapore, more countries or members, member states with more resources to offer that can push the agenda a little bit. 
uh, and uh, from a Sri Lankan perspective, also it, it the goals of of Iora in terms of sustainable green development, maritime security, uh, you know, scientific explore, exploration also fit quite well for Sri Lanka's needs in the future. And and uh, Australia and India have both been very active on digital diplomacy in terms of convening foreign ministers, senior officials. Uh, perhaps the next step could be for them to push um, such a digital forum for Iora. Dinusha, let me now push you into the geopolitics a bit, uh, and uh, please be less diplomatic than George <laughs> on this. It's, it's a, I know it's a touchy issue, but we've seen in mid-March uh, China announcing a $500 million uh, financial package of support to Sri Lanka over, I think, 10 years or something. We don't know exactly the details. Maybe you can help us, maybe not. But if you could put this in the context of Sri Lanka's balancing game, you know, between keeping India happy, connecting with India, a lot of good initiatives happening between India and Sri Lanka. At the same time, you know, a possible MCC grant from the US, you know, which didn't go ahead for against foreign security and independence and non-alignment concerns. concerns. At the same time, the Chinese coming in with coming in added on support here. If you could navigate us into these difficult choices for Sri Lanka, what you expect in terms of realignments or just business as usual in Sri Lanka's foreign policy. Sure. Sure. Um, um, is there an echo? Is there an echo that, that you're hearing? No, we're fine. Okay. 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 Uh, so, uh, so one. Of, I apologize. I'm hearing an echo. Um, all right. Um, what one of the things that is uh, is difficult for all smaller states at at this point uh, is just watching the the, the rising U.S. China tensions, obviously. Um, I was struck by a comment by Ian Bremer of uh, the Eurasia Group uh, in a recent uh, uh, podcast or video interview where he described the US as increasingly non-aligned, which I thought was a, a quite a remarkable term to use for you know, the, the dominant power, um, but also actually increasingly apt. Um, so, you know, I think Sri Lanka, um, if if the if the U.S. is moving to more non-alignment, you know, you can imagine that smaller states are also really uh, in a state of flux and trying to trying to manage it by going back to first principles of their foreign policy. You know, and and non-alignment has been a theme. Of course, there are difficulties with the term in that it means different things to different people. And uh, but you know, broadly speaking. Sri Lanka is going to try to engage with the plurality of actors, um, uh, and that uh, will include anyone that it feels can contribute to its immediate needs. And its immediate needs, as I mentioned earlier, are, are very much uh, economic. Uh, it has sought uh, both bilateral and multilateral aid from a variety of sources. So it's in talks with the ADB. Um, and the AIIB as well for 300 million. Um, I think AIB has, has granted a 500 million uh, facility to India um, uh, and ADB 500 million to Bangladesh. Sri Lanka is still in talks for those. Um, it has received um, some funding from the World Bank, 127 million, I believe, uh, and around 20 something million from the EU. Uh, but you know, the bigger amounts are not yet coming from the other multilateral or bilateral actors. So in, in that situation, um, of course, the, the, the ones that get publicity are the, the, the Chinese loans. And I, I echo what uh, George said about, you know, there are a lot of people contributing, but sometimes the, the Chinese um, contributions get sort of outsized, uh, outsized focus. Uh, you raised a very good point about the, about the MCC, however. Um, you know, there is a real question as to why Sri Lanka refused the MCC. Uh, it appears to be still on the table. Uh, that is something that would seem, you know, logical given that we're going for loans and swap facilities. One uh, 400 million swap facility was approved by India. Uh, should we then really look at the MCC again? That would seem a, um, you know, a, a rational thing to do in, in these circumstances. Thanks, Dinusha. Uh, George, we'll go to you uh, and go back a bit to the domestic level. Uh, 
And, you know, there's a question coming in from Ashray Pandey. He asks, you know, whether the narrative of crisis resilience can be turned into an economic nationalist position by the Oli government to reignite its popularity and putting sort of connectivity and openness on the back burner. In many ways, I think this question applies to all countries in the region. You think this crisis has actually given many of these governments and leaders a second wind, uh, an opportunity to congregate, to say, you know, let's be united and let's focus on nationalism. Uh, and sometimes also in sort of some uh, ways, uh, majoritarianism and some policies that may actually try to portray enemies without and within. Well, I mean, speaking directly to the current ruling dispensation, I mean, Ashra is taking that from my recent article on crisis resilience. But basically the point there that I make is that Nepal has to have an overt policy that focuses on a crisis because of its perennial vulnerability to crisis. And that crisis has less to do with borders per se than to do with natural disaster, for example. And it's a massive reliance on one or two sort of macroeconomic uh, contributors like remittance, which frankly, Nepal has not, not done much of harvesting of the remittance economy. Uh, it's kind of chugging along by default. Uh, and so to me, I mean, that's, that's one point. The other is that it's hard for crisis resilience to be turned into a one party ideological kind of a response to this. Uh, this is a, a, an existential issue for Nepal. So regardless of party, which is the most di disappointing thing in Nepali politics is that we don't really have an opposition. And as you've seen from my writings elsewhere, I've described Nepal as a kleptocratic state where everyone sort of colludes with the other to extract rent from the state, whether it's foreign aid or whether it's natural resources. So in that sense, we don't have an opposition that's honest, that uh, is articulating a different viewpoint than the ruling dispensation. Uh, and so what we are facing is a lack of a common understanding and concept, conceptual clarity across all political formations about what matters to Nepal in terms of national interest. And crisis resilience, for example, is a matter of national interest. It's not only a party interest. So I don't see Oli using this as his sort of sole uh, domain for dominance. The other point is that he's significantly weakened recently through the stunts he pulled in terms of uh, the ordinances that he got the president to sign uh, regarding uh, how um, parties could split, et cetera. That backfired very poorly, resulting in even a weaker position for him, so much so that he has not gone to parliament for the last several days where parliament is sitting in the budget session. And I fear that, I, I think that that's because of his fear of a no confidence motion. I don't see Oli mounting these kinds of uh, a last uh, sort of last minute stands in this format, because I think, I think what's happening is the aftermath of this crisis is gonna be so severe that it's going to take an all party kind of an approach to bring Nepal out of this crisis. Uh, if I can just go back to an earlier point about India versus the neighborhood in terms of connectivity. And I talked about the cost of collective action in terms of connectivity. Who does this connectivity serve the most? I mean, so far as Munir also alluded, the conversation is always about India pushing regional networks, whether it's outside of SARC or uh, you know, with SARC or criticizing SARC vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis Pakistan. I think that India has a huge role to play in promoting connectivity just among the states uh, of uh, South Asia without any necessary, necessary sort of monetary benefit to India that's direct. In other words, promoting connectivity for the sake of connectivity among the smaller states. So Nepal, Bangladesh, I mean, recently, uh, you know, as several months ago, as you know, India really helped with that connectivity, but there are many more that could be made I really think that India has a role in that kind of a goodwill gesture. India's um, proximity to Nepal through the border is another example where there is no concern really about China increasing its connectivity to Nepal over India's connectivity. The cost to India and to Nepal of promoting connectivity to each other is far lower with benefits being far higher with regard to China as opposed to China. So, I mean, China may make a lot of noise about being able to be equal to India in terms of near nearness. But in terms of Nepali foreign policy, it's time to really be pragmatic and understand what China offers and what India offers. And if you just look at the evidence, it's clear that there are, there are lower costs for certain kinds of connectivity to the rest of South Asia via India. And there are other kinds of benefits to connectivity to China. And those have to be explored. And this, this conversation about equidistance, I think is nonsensical and it's very old, it's dated. 
there has to be a way of describing Nepali self-interest in more sophisticated terms. And I think the time for that is the post-crisis time where connectivity is also one of the issues to be discussed. Thank you, great, George. Uh, especially that, that reference to equidistance, which also upsets me often. I mean, uh, maybe there will be the time of equidistance, but uh, in pure geography, still technology hasn't been able to, to bridge that uh, geographic difference between Nepal and India and China. So that has to be considered whatever your strategy is. Uh, Munir, if you may move to you. Uh, um, you know, I, we spoke about this, uh, I think yesterday in a, in a chat we had about the India-Bangladesh relationship. Uh, and also the, India, the Bangladesh Myanmar relationship to uh, your, your, uh, your, your two main, uh, your two only neighbors uh, in terms of land boundaries. But, uh, you know, preceding this crisis, there were moments of tension already between Dhaka and Delhi on the C, on the constitution amendment uh, in India on the citizenship bill. Uh, there were tensions with the Rohingya in Myanmar. Uh, so if you could just walk us through a bit of how you in Dhaka and other people you interact with look at the uh, importance of bilateral relationships with India and Myanmar as part of a larger connectivity agenda and whether that is hurting that agenda uh, uh, towards regionalism. Um, you see, the thing is, uh, there are two sides to India. I mean, as you know, I also get to see you. I do go to Delhi quite often and we have recently started office in Delhi. So, Indians, by and large, are in the bureaucracy or other, have been very open, friendly people. And I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll give a very simple example. When I first thought of opening office in Delhi, everyone discouraged me that, you know, the government will be skeptical uh, toward any civil society outfit coming from outside. And 90% of people discouraged me. But to my present surprise, when I moved in, I got all the support I needed. But the point is, you mentioned about India, Bangladesh. Now, if you look at last 10, 15 years, relationships have been very good, but from a Bangladeshi perspective, we have always felt whatever insurgency, other activities were based in Bangladeshi soil, the current government led by the prime minister have very effectively uprooted that. India now has one of the safest borders running with Bangladesh thousands of miles, which has enabled India to massively redeploy resources to other fronts, right? Now, after having done that, when we are left hostage to a tista water, year after year after year, the Manmohan Singh came, then the West Bengal chief minister came. So every time there's a ray of hope, every time we're being told, okay, the West Bengal election will be over, then water will come, that has not happened, number one. Number two, the NRC issue. I mean, the going by facts, a significant portion of people who are there does not necessarily have come from Bangladesh, and also many of them do jobs with Assamese don't do in any case. You alluded to the recent constitution amendment. Let me reverse and put it this way. So for example, our parliament adopts a motion, passes a bill, which says something like that any persecuted minority in the Bangladesh neighborhood will receive humanitarian assistance asylum other than Hindus. How does it sound? So what we expect us to believe, and, and you, two things you alluded to, there was a little bit of uh, reaction from our government as well, which I think was quite fair because you are pinpointing three countries, Bangladesh being one of them, after telling that we are the role model of friendship in the neighborhood, doesn't hold valid. I'll give another example. When I was, op when I, when I, when I was doing this think tank thing and opening an account, to, to my utter shock, I found out if you are a foreigner and opening an uh, account, bank account in India, if you're a citizen of Pakistan and Bangladesh, you have to go through several additional layers of clearances. So I felt that we, after being such a great uh, friendship or honeymoon period, whatever, Bangladesh is still bracketed with Pakistan in terms of uh, accessing, a, opening a bank account. So you see, confident trust building has to happen in what you do, not in just what you say. So as much as India is a great friend and there is much to, I mean, culture, history, heritage, education, India has been a great partner. And whenever I spend time in Delhi, I'm so much overjoyed by the lovely companionship I have with people around. But at the political administrative level, I think there needs to be a little more confidence building. I would just go to what George was saying. There needs to be confidence building measures and it has to be led by India. 
And even between India and Pakistan, going by size and scope, definitely India is far, far not even comparable. So by having this equal, equal sort of equal comparison between India and Pakistan, I think Pakistan gains more, India loses more. Because two different countries in group plateaus are always compared together. So I would strongly urge, with just to add into what George said, India should, and this COVID-19 can be a very good occasion. Whatever Prime Minister Modi has done, if you can go to the next level, as I just alluded, pick up the phone, give a call to Imran Khan, bring the countries together, show the region and India should have been the natural leader in this region a long time back. The fact it has not happened calls for introspection, why it has not happened. And you had had different answers from both Dinusha and George in different ways they alluded to China and India, which I think is already covered. So yes, bilaterally we have had successes, but there are some issues. And now going back to Rohingya thing, I'll put it very simply. Bangladesh has not been fairly treated by the international community. We are a resource constrained country, stuck up with one close to 1.5 million people. And Myanmar has no genuine desire to take them back. It's not crystal clear. And now we have, as I was talking to you yesterday, that Myanmar uh, opening up Rakhine for investment and uh, you know, some of the country, including India going in. So our question is fine, we welcome any investment in the neighborhood, but it should be preconditioned to safe and dignified return of the Rohingyas. Turkey has per capita income eight times more than Bangladesh does, right? And Turkey receives per refugee $150, we receive only $20. So we are in a very precarious situation and we believe India could have played a more active role and it should not be just China who's mediating between Myanmar and Bangladesh. I think India had a much more, given its good relation with both the countries to play in this particular aspect. So it's a serious problem for us and we cannot forever with living with this kind of population. Uh, I mean, you know, it has already been, and in the next three decades, this cat and mouse game is going on. So yes, it's a very big issue. And the problem is in the extreme case, if you have extremism rising, when you have people in the age group of 15, 25 year old without job, without education year after year, and if it rises in this region, trust me, no country will be safe. So it's not a Bangladesh problem, it's a regional problem. So other countries in the region need to pay closer attention. The seeds of extremism that is breeding in the ground if these keep on going unattended for long. Thanks, Timothy. Thank you, thank you, Maria. A very good point, and I, I I share your perspective. But at the same time, of course, as you know, there's been also in terms of doing something, not just saying a lot of interesting developments on infrastructure connectivity in the region, right? India and Bangladesh, in many ways, I mean, it's been amazing of how much they've been achieved the last years in terms of railways uh, links and connectivity, integrated uh, border po check posts on the borders, trade facilitation. Um, and, and that's also, I think, a, a, a good sign in terms of activity and just in, instead of just talking. Uh, Dinusha, if we may come to you and in, in, uh, uh, come in from Colombo on, on a particular question, I think you've been observing um, a lot and coming back to your earlier answer about, you know, many ways, uh, Sri Lanka trying to diversify, trying to put its eggs in different baskets, hedging, keeping a balance. Uh, I think all, all states are trying to do this. It's a return of non-alignment in a mini style in many other South Asian states beyond just the classic Indian non-alignment. But what role, this is a question coming from Saurabh Kumar at Cuts in Jaipur. He asks, do you see a reduced role of global development institutions in this region uh, relating to connectivity and development? And I think he's alluding also what this bilateralism coming up, right? India giving up, support, giving support to Sri Lanka in a race, and you have the Chinese coming in, the Americans also in a bilateral approach to MCC, for example. To what extent do we have, you know, global classic institutions like the World Bank, uh, the Asian Development Bank, uh, the IMF, still calling the shots or as influential as they used to be 10 years ago? And if they're not, is that good? Is that bad? Are there alternatives like the AIIB? Uh, how do you look at that from, from Sri Lanka? Uh, you're muted. Sorry, yes. that's a really interesting question. Uh, thank you for that. I would say that um, it's too early to count out uh, global institutions from the mix of actors that Sri Lanka will 
uh, look to um, in order to meet its development and foreign policy goals. So as I mentioned earlier, it, it has gone to the AIB and the ADB, the World Bank, the IFC, you know, so the, the whole range um, uh, and equally pursued the bilateral routes as well. So I, I would say they're complementary rather than um, exclusive or one uh, pushing out the other. Certainly the AIIB has added more options to the uh, the menu of uh, multilateral organizations, uh, just as China has obviously increased the uh, the capacity for bilateral lending. Uh, and as China has given more, we have seen things like the MCC grant um, uh, present themselves a, a, as options as well for Sri Lanka. So um, yeah, I, I would say uh, it, it's it's too early. And interestingly, you're also seeing uh, partnerships between the you know, particular countries and the international institutions. So uh, I think it was just recently that uh, Sri Lanka received uh, uh, 800,000 worth mm -hmm. of medical supplies from um, the WHO, but supported by DFAT in Australia. So, you know, an Australia WHO uh, consortium. The In some ways, I think the the reliance on international organizations might even slightly increase, uh, particularly as international organizations start supporting uh, private equity type of funding arrangements. So uh, Sri Lanka is now making quite a lot of noise about we need to fund new infrastructure by debt, uh, by equity rather than debt. Um, and of course, you know, uh, equity is in a way a more fluid environment, but we have seen the AIIB give very substantial support to private equity funds. Uh, and those are something that uh, uh, Sri Lanka can tap into. Uh, the Green Climate Fund is something else uh, along the same lines that, uh, that, that Sri Lanka did get a, a small grant from back in, I think, 2016. So, um, so I think you see a, um, a wider menu. In terms of bilateral assistance, however, and this ties into uh, what uh, Georgia Munir was saying about India taking, or Munir was saying about India taking more of a lead. Um, I do see on infrastructure development, um, a potential opening uh, for, for India. So China has, has now almost branded itself as the, the physical, infrastructure funder uh, for Southeast Asia, South Asia and beyond. There is an opening, I think, for, for India to come in as the, especially at this time, uh, as the digital infrastructure provider. Uh, we, you know, for all we talk about sort of, uh, you know, e-commerce and, you know, I spoke about virtual museums and so forth, but, but inter internet penetration rates are low, um, uh, mobile uh, smartphone penetration rates are also low, you know, in order to harness what uh, we really need in terms of digital growth in India, uh, in, in South Asia, I think India is uniquely placed to, to try and fill that, fill that vacuum. It will need to act very fast, however, because China is already in that space. Uh, we see just one example of that was uh, Alibaba's purchase of Daraz, uh, an online e-commerce uh, uh, platform which exists in, in, in um, I think, Bangladesh, uh, Nepal, uh, Pakistan, and, and Myanmar as well. Uh, so, so they're already in there, um, and and I think India would have to move quite quickly to to reap the possible benefits for itself. If I can, Tini, if I can just add on to what uh, just Danusha said in India. Yes, please. I, I, Danusha, I mean, you very correctly mentioned Danusha that uh, Dalas thing. A classic example of fatal hesitation. I mean, by hesitating at times, India have lost it. In Rohingya case, a classic example, India was very ideally poised, having common borders too. Then what happened? At some stage, China stepped in, and then India got completely sidelined. And I wrote a number of pieces in India also when this crisis was boiling. So in certain cases, I guess India needs to be a little more proactive. And you have uh, mentioned, you know, mentioned very correctly, a lot of good things happen between us, connectivity, road, rail, cheap waterways, definitely a lot of things. But at the broader political spectrum level, India needs to be a little more gutsy and a little more, you know, lead from the frog. So that will automatically spiral back to your original question, BIMSTEC, connectivity, SARC, because that's the crux of the thing. 
whether you are willing to take that regional leadership, you, whether you are willing to put aside small contentious bilateral issues, get the big picture, and that will serve not only India, the region as well. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, uh, Munir. Uh, in fact, I mean, someone was saying, uh, we got one anonymous comment saying, you should have an Indian speaker to give good news about what India is doing. And I think, as I mentioned in the beginning, this is exactly the point, you know, we here in India hear a lot about good Indian initiatives. We're well aware of it. We write about it. We research about it. But I thought it was very useful and it's being very useful this discussion. We have another 20 minutes to talk about how you see Indian initiatives and regional initiatives and global uh, uh, development, uh, especially during and post this crisis. George, uh, take the question where you want it. But one thing I'm very curious to know from you is, you know, Nepal over the last two years has been pushing this agenda that we don't need development assistance and loans. We need hard investment. We need hard financial capital to develop the infrastructure of the country. Do you see that becoming more difficult now uh, in, the, in, the, in this crisis and this global recession? Um, I do, but before that, may, uh, may I just add on to Dinusha and Munir's points about uh, aid. Uh, as you know, Nepal is more dependent on aid than many other countries that we've referred to, uh, uh, especially for expenditures related to development. And to me, I see uh, you know, the difficulties arriving in terms of bilateral aid uh, uh, as opposed to multilateral aid. Uh, partly because of the politics of the countries where uh, who give aid to Nepal. I mean, the U.S. is a major funder of uh, development aid in Nepal. Uh, there are several others, Japan, uh, you know, uh, and the European Union. Um, so I would say that bilateral aid surely is uh, uh, is something that's going to be looked at very carefully, just because of politics back home uh, in the in the in the giving country. But I don't see a reduction in aid, for example, with health. Uh, and so uh, I, I see that growing. You can already see a lot of sort of solicitations out there in the global marketplace for that kind of work. Um, and, and multilaterally, of course, Nepal has already been successful in getting debt relief along with a bunch of other countries uh, and, 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 and promises made by ADB and others to support Nepal. So uh, in terms of foreign aid, I think Nepal will continue to enjoy it, perhaps going back to uh, more of health related assistance and less of the more esoteric types of areas of work. I mean, I personally, being a political scientist, worry about the governance-related assistance that Nepal would ever get now, especially coming to your question about, well, give us support for hard infrastructure. There's a big problem with that here because, uh, you know, recently, with regard to the emphasis on infrastructure in Nepal, I mean, as you know, China has won most of the bids. And there's this whole global discourse around how China wins most of these bids. I won't get into that, but one of the things, smart things that China, uh, India, uh, Nepali builders have done is they've allied with Chinese companies to win most of these bids. And whenever Nepali builders have allied with Indian companies, they've lost the bids because of the relative cost uh, issue. Um, I don't know how India is gonna get around that. I mean, I found it a real tragedy that Nepal's parliament building bid was lost by Indian companies, for example. I mean, we are fellow democracies, right? I mean, it would be awesome if a democratic parliament building could be built by another world's largest democracy, but that didn't happen. And I think partly uh, this is where, uh, you know, Munir is saying, well, India could have actually, I don't know. I mean, I don't know the intricacies of how the bureaucracy in India works, but, you know, you could have actually discounted the value of that bid by offering a grant out and out from India's side. Uh, and that could have helped uh, instead of making it a regular sort of a procurement. Um, I really feel that there are areas where, uh, I mean, I don't think it's really India bashing uh, or anything, but it's it's really, um, I find uh, uh, as the son of uh, Indians who moved to Nepal in the 50s, I see that India routinely snatches defeat from the jaws of victory, so to speak. And that, you know, that, that happens all the time. And I think it's this lack of nimbleness and that nimbleness may have to do with the way that relations are so statist and dependent on the state bureaucracy to deliver. I mean, construction projects that India has funded in Nepal began well before China started, but many of them have not been finished, as you note on your Samanda project website also, with regard to various roads and other connectivity initiatives. It doesn't seem to move as quickly as the Chinese could. I'm not saying the Chinese end up finishing it. They are frequently behind schedule and cost a lot more. So uh, it's, it's one of those where, you know, the messaging uh, is good. Uh, the sort of the friend in need is a friend indeed kind of thing. I think the Chinese bring that to a real, a real uh, 
uh, art and science. Um, in terms of future infrastructural investment, uh, there are a lot of foreign uh, investors interested in supporting work like that in Nepal. Uh, unfortunately, our laws, while they're very good on paper, the implementation, contract protection, uh, the unionization of labor is extreme here in the, in, the, in, the, in the support of political parties. And so this, you know, the lack of certainty, you know, uh, in terms of uh, risk, what you can manage and what you can't, is a real block to foreign direct investment in Nepal. I mean, setting aside the problem of energy. I mean, you have to have energy also in terms of driving investment and productivity. So we don't have that. A lot of our problems are wicked policy problems in the true sense of the word that we've all studied about. And you can't really paper them over with Band-Aid approaches. Uh, and frankly, if you want me to be candid, the finance minister who's uh, you know, a PhD from, I think, Delhi School of Economics, he uh, you know, pres presented a budget that I don't regard as uh, very creative. And it, it really is about uh, near-term relief, but uh, many of the initiatives I think will go down the same way in terms of being hijacked by private sector interests and sort of very conventional ways of thinking about crisis. Great, George. So we'll have a, we have another 15 minutes. A great list of questions coming in. Uh, I'll have two more, one for Munir, one for Dinusha, and then a, a final one uh, by Vice Admiral uh, Pradeep Chawan, I think at the National Maritime Foundation, a slightly provocative one saying, are we being too fatalistic? Is this all as bad as we think it is? But I'll leave that to the end as a closing round. First to you, uh, Munir, there's a question from Muvafak uh, Shishaik. Uh, he really asks whether there's a potential in this crisis uh, in terms of formalizing informal trade. Uh, and let me add to that, do you think there's also an opportunity in Bangladesh to do significant reforms? George mentioned it in Nepal. In India, we will see, I think the finance minister has just spoken here announcing what this package means and also in terms of structural reforms in the country. And if so, third question, these reforms, where do you expect in Bangladesh to be a greatest emphasis on economic revival post-crisis and therefore also opportunities for investment from outside? Quite a tall list. Read for you. <laughs> no, the thing is, uh, as I think in my previous comments, I mentioned that uh, one of the uh, good thing I think for Bangladesh is uh, this, uh, which I personally have always spoke, spoke out against over reliance on one particular sector that is RNG and then textile. So uh, just as you know, a few years back when we had this collapse of Rana Plaza building and you know, we were about to lose a lot of uh, overseas orders and we were trembling with what will happen if actually Europeans and Americans start you know, canceling. I mean, a lot of uh, bad branding of Bangladesh, you know, like you know, blood clothes and so on. So we recovered from that. We were able to convince of our due diligence meeting international standard. The question is, I think probably we will need to fundamentally uh, post COVID uh, and government probably has to give a lead. I mean, I have nothing against this uh, stimulus package being given out to whatever uh, export oriented R&D factories, but I think we seriously need to look into diversifying our export basket and taking advantage of some of the regional advantages that we have with countries like India, Sri Lanka, Nepal, so on and so forth. So we will literally need to look into what are some of the export commodities which have a competitive edge in the neighborhood and how we can taking advantage of the closed location. And as uh, George also mentioned, some of the connectivity routes can happen with the help of India, take advantage of that. So this whole post-COVID regional scenario not only needs political guts, it's also, it's also needs certain degree of vision from the business community, from the bureaucrats, from the governments, because not in every uh, lifetime you get such a reboot. It's a reboot of the entire system. Uh, everyone is part of it. I mean, even the way, like this, this webinar thing, for example, this is becoming more a part of life. And I'm sure even if normal situation arises, we'll be more tuned to webinar than we were before this crisis, right? So in post-COVID or COVID normal world, there has to be serious rethinking of both economy, structural change, reform. And one of the things we have not talked about, we really need to focus in this part of the world. What happens to the marginalized groups, vulnerable groups? What happens to the women? What happens to those on the fringes of the economy? How do we address them? What happens to those who are really on the verge of you know, extinction of life because of the lockdowns? Those are some fundamental questions we have to answer first. And what kind of going forward we don't have a much big social safety network scheme, but in some form, we have to seriously, seriously start thinking as if a second such COVID thing arises, what do you do with these people? 
I mean, those, you know, some of the people, our prime minister, other prime minister have been talking that, you know, we cannot afford this. So one is the restructuring at the basic level so that those who are in the fringes, they can still survive. Then you move to the second level, the middle class who are still being alive at their home, maybe not in the most prosperous situation, maybe have facing a lot of salary cuts. And the third level come the business community. So there has to be three level structural adjustment and the government has to lead from the front as then opposed to giving a, you know, chamber body, you come out with what you need, we will help you. It doesn't work that way. Government is the guardian of all the three constituencies, as I mentioned to you. The government has to lead from the front and Bangladesh is no exception. Now coming to regional thing, one of the good things you could have easily started, exchange of regional healthcare information system. Look at Kerala, you have done a great job. Kerala is being cited in India, how the government has effectively monitored, kept it under check, even quarantine people, how they have been shown in the you know, social media being well taken. Even India, there's a lot of talk, other step would have learned from Kerala. So we can also learn from Kerala. So India, countries like India, even Sri Lanka, others have the cost efficient way to come together is to start exchanging knowledge and know-how which we do well. We don't have that kind of money like EU does. We don't have Germany and France to back up. If something goes wrong, Germany bails out Greece or France bail out somewhere. We don't have that kind of economic, you know, sort of uh, money in our pocket. So best thing is to push the low hanging fruits, try to get, and I'm quite optimistic that this post COVID or COVID normal situation can bring down a new era for South Asia, if our leaderships can rise to the occasion, and that automatically leads to the reforms you're talking about. At, and in my opinion, at three level, marginalized, middle class, then of course the upper academy. It has to be that way. But at this stage, it's a little premature to answer because we are every day struggling with this evolving nature of things, not exactly knowing, except for a few industries like aviation, tourism, which we know are very badly hit, financial institutions. Others, we really have to see how much they have bled, and how much bandage has to be done, and how much long term sustenance can be ensured. Yes. Atio, Thank you. My name. Yeah. You know, this, uh, this idea of connectivity and how uh, you know benefits can be gained uh, and how costs are incurred. I think uh, this point about the informal sector and informality, I mean, in our work here, we really are trying to get uh, people to talk about informality. It is the forgotten majority in Nepal, at least, where 80, over 80% 80 of our workforce is informal. And if you look at you know, who bears the cost of crisis, it is the informal. Uh, and so you know, talking about maybe the possibility of a South Asian definition for vulnerability. Because I think, uh, you know, for example, vulnerability in the development discourse is defined in dollar terms, sometimes it's defined in terms of violence or, or conflicts. But, you know, the, the intersection, you know, uh, of, of, of vulnerability with informality, I think is, is the crux of the issue in terms of governance. I mean, if we can't take care of the least among us, then what is the point of talking about democratic government, especially, right? And so what Munir has said, I think rings true, even in any initiative like connectivity, yes, formal government may benefit, formal sectors may benefit, but how does the informal sector benefit and what is the cost they pay? As with any crisis, uh, this group where they are both informal and because of that informality, they are vulnerable, much more vulnerable than those who may be formally poor, the informally poor are far more vulnerable. So, you know, this, this whole policy choice around formal versus informal, I think, is a direction that uh, discourse needs to move in as well, whenever we talk about such initiatives. One point on the health one, I, I was very heartened to, I also listened to Prime Minister Modi's uh, speech, it was mercifully short for a change, but there, there was this, uh, this initiative where he noted how India has gone from having almost zero PPE and testing capability to producing, I believe, 200,000 a day, or some, some stunning number like that. And to me, it seems like, and, and frankly, given the sort of the patchiness of Chinese uh, testing kits and PPE, I mean, you could see India being the major supplier, not only of the drugs that it certainly is the global leader on, but also for South Asia, initiatives around public health, where any supply chain in the future is going to be closely tied to the guarantee of uh, public safety and public health. Any future supply chain is going to be attached to that. So any consideration on connectivity is going to also include that. So this, you know, India could play that role also of being through connectivity, being uh, guaranteeing supply chains that are also healthy supply chains, so to speak. 
great, great point, George. I think a very valid effect it reminds me that when India restricted its exports on the pharma products uh, to many countries, uh, or when it left, when it lifted restrictions, the neighborhood and the neighboring countries were accepted from that initially, from that first uh, lift. And there was an emphasis on immediate delivery to all countries in need, but the exception was specified for, for neighboring countries. But I think beyond just sort of punctual delivery, what you're hinting at is that there needs to be more of a public health dialogue in terms of integrating the pharma markets, the industry, the research and development also on the health sector in South Asia to respond to crises that I'm sorry to say, but I think will become more recurrent as we see a more globalized world, right? We had the previous crisis in the 2000s. Uh, this is just another iteration of that. Uh, Dinusha, the sort of a last question before we go to the closing uh, provocative round of, uh, uh, um, you know, I, Sri Lanka is of course in a very different geographic situation from Nepal. You are an island state, you are exposed at the heart of the Indian Ocean. Uh, this has been an area of tremendous competition, but also very interesting developments with new regional institutions, IORA being revived or capacitated. This whole focus on the Indo-Pacific from the US to Australia and Japan, the Japanese with their Asia-Africa growth corridor. I'm not sure where that is now, but certainly an emphasis there on the maritime aspect of connectivity and governance. Um, and most recently, I think the quadrilateral dialogue between US, Japan, Australia, and India, which we traditionally looked at only from defense and security, had actually a whole discussion on health emergencies and uh, a response to COVID. How do you see the debate shaping in Sri Lanka um, on this sort of Southern angle of your foreign policy on the Indian Ocean region, whether there are opportunities there, or will this lead to a Sri Lanka that is again more aligned northwards to India, to China, Southeast Asia, or will we see a more sort of outward Sri Lanka towards Australia, Africa, maybe in the in the Indian Ocean island states? I think you'll actually see, um, that's a good question, uh, Tina. I, I think you'll see a little bit more reticence um, with um, engaging uh, actively with uh, security related groupings. Um, IORA is, is sort of, has a more multi-dimensional image, if you like. Um, I, I take your point that the Quad is trying to change that, but it's still, you know, it's, it's original uh, purpose and uh, at least uh, perceived purpose is very much security focused. Uh, so I, I think in this situation that we're in, uh, we'll see Sri Lanka re sort of relying more on those first principles that I spoke about earlier, the, the neutrality, the non-alignment, the, I think a previous foreign, foreign minister used the word, um, uh, you know, omnidirectionality uh, of foreign policy, uh, rather than uh, trying to um, to engage very actively with uh, security-related uh, groupings or perceived security-related groupings. Um, so one example of that was, you know, uh, recently I think there was a, a formal a press release by the Ministry of Foreign Relations in Sri Lanka thanking Cuba for its role in helping Sri Lankan nationals in Haiti. Um, so you're seeing, you know, thanks go out to a really wide range of uh, countries uh, right across uh, the globe. At the same time, we will, I think, continue to see the natural engagement with, uh, with India on, on security related exercises uh, and Maldives as well in the trilateral. I mean, we would expect to see that continue, uh, you know, multiple ship visits, for, uh, for example, I, I would say those would, uh, would all continue. Thanks, uh, Dinusha. In fact, I think I was thinking also of the recent US-Sri Lanka defense agreement, as you know, which uh, didn't go ahead a few months ago and was involved also in some polemic. Maybe that's an indication of that, but uh, maybe for some other time we could discuss also why. I'm very curious to see why Sri Lanka is adopting that policy. Is it under pressure from China? Is it just keeping all its options open, which is a normal hedging policy? Mm -hmm. Uh, but that's, I think many states, in fact, are, are facing this. Uh, Sri Lanka is not alone in, in, in that uh, uh, boat of the temptations of non-alignment because it's a difficult game to play as Nepal is finding out, as many other countries are finding out. Mm -hmm. uh, let's, uh, we have two minutes. If I request three minutes in one minute each, uh, um, 
if you could respond to a slightly provocative question coming in from Vice Admiral Pradeep Chawan, he uh, is here at the National Maritime Foundation in India. He lists all the crises of the last 20th century. We had pandemics, we've had wars, we've had conflicts. And still, and despite that, he says, uh, and I'm summarizing here, the logic of interdependence, of connectivity, of globalism has advanced incrementally over the last 100 years, in fact, over the last 150 years, if you want, since the late 19th century. And that's almost sort of this linear progression with hiccups. So he's saying, and actually he asks, are we not here, including on this webinar, and I quote, panicking uh, with Cassandran prophecies about doom and, and gloom in terms of disconnection, uh, disaggregation, fragmentation, introversion. And so provocative question, what are your thoughts about this? Are there also opportunities maybe here? And is this logic of interdependence irreversibly locked in for the region and uh, in particular, and also for the world at large? Uh, maybe we can start in uh, reverse order. George, would you like to go first? Um, sure. Um... Yeah, sure. We have we've had this experience in Nepal has been particularly exposed to some of these in terms of the effects more than others because of its, I mean, we have a naturally stoic kind of a society, but our resilience has uh, frequently been found wanting. Um, I think that the effects of not of globalism, but globalization have been that it's lulled us into this complacency uh, with regard to uh, uh, taking for granted supply chains, for example. Uh, or the sort of the ability of uh, communication technology to convey information accurately and quickly to us. The effect of complacency with quick, uh, accurate information transmission uh, has resulted in us uh, reacting before we have the full picture. And in many ways, as events unfold, the effects of those events, uh, uh, the systems, the feedback loops and the learning mechanisms weren't put in place by the countries uh, that appear to be more affected than others. If you see the ones that are less panicky, they are the ones who've learned from previous crises, right? I mean, the examples of Singapore and Japan and South Korea, for example, have been touted. But, uh, you know, the, one of the conflations that's occurring, Tino, is uh, muscular reactions like lockdowns are touted as successes. I mean, I don't regard that as success. In fact, I regard that as a panicked reaction from governments who know very well that they can't do anything else. So in many ways, uh, some buy time to do something like India has done. Uh, in Nepal, frankly, even if you saw today's op-eds and editorial, you'll see we've not done much in terms of preparing. All we've done is prevent people from meeting each other. So uh, I think the panic relates to complacency and the panic relates to our inability to use the information technology of the globalized world to inform each other about valuable evidence around such crises. Um, and uh, frankly, you don't hear a lot in the general media about alternate hypotheses or alternate theories about what's going to happen. As you very well know, this Israeli uh, a former Air Force Major General is very well known now for having shown the, the curve and how infections would drop off if you, know, you, you close down everything for nine weeks or 16 weeks or something else, some period. But it's an alternative theory. Of course, some people buy, buy it, some don't. But there's not enough balance in this globalized world of information sharing, there's a lot of tendency to skew it uh, to favor a certain political ideology or a dispensation. So to me, that's happening also in Nepal where you could, you know, you could see that uh, the reaction, many touting as a success in terms of very low uh, infection rates is simply because we have not tested enough because we haven't prepared enough despite having such close connections to people like India and China. Uh, so it's a combination, um, I don't see I, I see the complacency returning because the human state is such where once you're satisfied, you keep seeking, uh, you forget about those basic needs and you keep going towards more sophisticated needs, forgetting that it's built on top of the basic needs. So the return to basic needs like uh, that inform resilience like energy and food in terms of looking inwards, I certainly think is valid. But then discarding and jettisoning all the links to the rest of the world, I think is foolish. Or what would happen simply is uh, identification of robust supply chains closer to home perhaps, and that can guarantee uh, the health of both the supplier and the recipient. Closer to home, interesting point on the region, uh, an opportunity there. Uh, Munir, I know you have to move very soon, so let's take it very shortly, you and then Dinusha. Uh, is there an opportunity or are we just being prophecies of doom? I wouldn't, uh, 
I wouldn't put it that way, doomed. There, as I said, there is a lot of opportunities, but we also have to be aware of one of the first fundamental thing, I guess, in the mindset we have to inject in, we have to start getting comfortable making difficult decisions with very ambiguity and very less information. That is just something we are very used to. We always rely on a lot of data, research, and so on and so forth. And all that goes into what George's uh, was the mindset. Like, you know, I, when you ask me, why Muni, did you do this policy? Why did you take this? I have some numbers to back up. It's like uh, to make it, to make the comparison a little more simpler. I mean, you know, the consulting firms, McKinsey's and BCG's, what do they do? I mean, when they hire people, they actually see how you deal with ambiguous situation in a rational fashion, right? You have an ambiguity. So our political leadership, unfortunately, is not tuned to that kind of uh, environment very well. So it will be a huge challenge for them. And as George was alluding, uh, first thing to do is to lock up without even knowing why you're doing it. Okay, everyone is doing it. started with China and Wuhan, right? Then everyone started following, not to even the Western countries, right? But in our case, it's compounded by the fact we have severe resource constraint. We have severe limitation of access to technology and other things. So even countries with access to this, you see what has happened with UK when they've shifted from stay alert and there's a lot of reaction to what does stay alert means. I mean, even in UK, there have been a lot of issues. In our case, it's compounded by the fact we have serious issues. The first fundamental thing is we have to get used to making tough decisions under very uncertain situation. But I think it's a, in my opinion, it's a much needed reboot we needed. And I personally look at it very positively because many of the things we are fast pacing too much without thinking what we are doing, it will now force all of us at every level, political leadership, administration, business community, civil society, even including ourselves, to look into the things which we have been doing, not only in the sense of just zooming around and having access to technology, the whole mindset thinking, that is the key challenge. And moving forward, there are three levels. One is the ideological philosophical level. Do we have a shift in terms of how society interacts with each other? Have we learned some lessons? Number two, the economic front. How do we recover and ensure next time something similar happens, we have the resiliency and there those things come up, marginalized group, under, you know, um, underprivileged group. And the third level is how do we take advantage of technology to connect the remaining two? So this will be connecting the dotted lines going forward. But I think we are capable of connecting the dotted lines. I think we can chart out a future we should give much more reasons for optimism, only if we are careful enough to lesson, learn the lessons carefully and to be ready and prepared to deal with a lot of uncertainty with certain degree of comfort. Thank you, Munir. And Bangladesh, in fact, has tremendous experience in developing governance frameworks uh, for sustainable development, right? And I think that's one of the secrets of why this economy is doing, was doing and is doing so well. I mean, in terms of GDP per capita, right? You've just, I think you're about to surpass India now. And it's really something work there. And I think certainly the governance story in terms of those, uh, uh, that openness uh, speaks volumes to the success in Bangladesh. Dinusha, last but not least, uh, what, what is your uh, optimism or pessimism as we look at the future? Uh, yeah, I, I would like to echo a lot of what Munir and, and also George said is, um, you know, that there is opportunity here, but it comes with uh, a willingness to, to really, um, engage intellectually and, and really in a uh, past a period of deep introversion, I would say. And I don't mean protectionism or, or any of that. I'm talking about sort of an intellectual introversion uh, that is needed to think, well, you know, how do we really go forward in the long term? And for Sri Lanka, there's some really constant, deep underlying questions that, you know, sort of keep growing um, year by year. Uh, unfortunately, the more pragmatic, immediate questions of economic necess necessity uh, are dominating. They, they need to dominate now. I, I, I see that. But we're never really going to escape from that, um, you know, that wheel uh, if we don't go back to the drawing board and think about um, you know, some of the, the larger questions. And I, I raised one of these at the beginning of uh, the discussion, which is, you know, that, that paradox of well, what is Sri Lanka's place in the world? You know, we, we, we're at this particular geography, uh, but, but how do we interact with the world? Because there's, there's lots of ambivalence there, lots of layers of ambivalence. Um, so a real need to, to go back to the drawing board and think 
uh, about fundamentals like health. I, I really uh, like the suggestion of a definition of vulnerability, um, of education, which is a longstanding issue, hasn't been changed for a long time. And we're seeing that now in terms of nimbleness of how to, how to respond is, is limited by uh, a fairly archaic education system. Um, and the bigger questions of, of unity and diversity and uh, that, that, that are, are always in the back, on the back burner and they won't go away un uh, until we address them. So, so it's an, there's an opportunity here to address them. Um, I question whether um, you know, we, we will really get there, but, but certainly in principle, there is that opportunity. Thanks, Dinush. I think a, a very good point to, to end this on because uh, I think you, all three of you highlighted the issue of governance. Shall I say soft connectivity in terms of the institutions, uh, the framework, the regulations, uh, the governance mechanisms that set the terms of your decision making of uh, on in specific sectors like health and education in particular, for example, right? Which I think in this last few years often we've overlooked uh, at the ex in terms of uh, in, uh, focusing tremendously on the hard infrastructure, right? On the terms of business as usual, whether it was ports, whether it was the terms of hard trade and goods. Uh, and this whole technological digital change is really emphasizing now the uh, human developmental capacity of these countries to address these challenges. That's a state capacity uh, issue at the heart of it. And there, I think what in particular makes uh, the region very interesting is that I think for the first time in 70 years, you have all of these countries in the region governed by a democratic framework. These are all open societies now with changes in government, with free media, which was not always the case. Uh, levels of violence and conflict are at a minimum uh, low uh, in the history of the subcontinent. So there's a tremendous opportunity also of sharing best practices of how to deal with governance challenges through an open society, right? And through uh, accountability, transparency, standards that really include citizens and are bringing different stakeholders together rather than sort of a top-down statist, whether it's a nationalist or authoritarian uh, approach. Uh, I wanna thank all of you. We ended uh, nine minutes uh, uh, beyond time. Uh, but uh, I think it was a very productive discussion of the last hour and a half. Uh, I really enjoyed learning from all of you and your perspectives of how you look at India, how you look at the region, how you look at the world, and how you look also at your own societies and polities as they are really uh, battling with this uh, pandemic and a variety of very difficult uh, decisions. Thanks all for making time. Uh, I hope to see you soon again and to remain in touch through the Samban Initiative or various other connectivity initiatives we are uh, working on here in South Asia. Thank you, bye-bye.